Kane Sport TV. Today we're going inside the Lions with Adam Gorney, who's Rivals.com's national recruiting director. And uh, it's after signing day. We've gone through an entire recruiting cycle now. And um, it's been quite a ride for the Miami Hurricanes, Adam, a a as you know, with the coaching change and Mario Cristobal coming in, an eight day flurry to try to get to signing day and um, a couple uh, late pickups for the, for the Canes. Um, from an outside perspective and a national perspective, um, tell us what you feel that you saw as you watched Miami's recruiting effort uh, this year. Yeah, I mean, with the coaching change especially, I think what stands out is Mario was just being Mario and he was doing the things that he's going to do and that Miami fans should expect him to do. He's going to be very aggressive. He's going to go after local kids. He's going to try to keep as many Miami kids home as possible. He's had tremendous success recruiting at Oregon, um, and kids are going to know uh, that he wants them home and that he's going to go after them. You know, you see him go in home with Nigel E. Kelly. He goes after those guys. He's not going to back down, and that's really um, what he's going to need to do to kind of rebuild that program, keep a lot of local talent home. Um, he has all the bona fides to do it, and I think, um, you know, you see nine commits right now, and a lot of people get nervous, but there's a lot of talent in those nine. He'll continue to build and look for 2023 to be a very, very big year. You use the phrase Mario being Mario. Um, what, what do you mean by that? Well, when he came to Oregon, he had really no connections to the program of any significance. And he went right into Southern California where all the talent is out here. Well, at least a lot of it. And, um, you know, did a tremendous job, better than USC, better than UCLA, um, loaded up. Went to Utah to get Noah Sewell, which was big. Went to Arizona to get Ty Thompson, a five-star quarterback who had every opportunity in the world. Um, and, and he really owned Southern California in a lot of ways. Kids who had wanted to go to USC or then wanted to go to Washington had now just basically, it, it had become known that Oregon was the school to go to, that the, that's where they wanted to be. They wanted to play for him and his assistants. I think all of that kind of played a, played a big factor and really what stands out to me about the way he recruits is that he's unapologetic. He's going to be very aggressive. He's going to go after his guys and he's going to get a lot of them. And so, um, you know, when he took over that Oregon program, he really had no traction and uh, he got it going very, very fast. And he recruited way better than anybody in the Pac-12. It's going to be a different case at Miami and there are different situations there that he's going to have to navigate through. Um, but he's going to be a tremendous, tremendous recruiter uh, for the Hurricanes, especially because he has connections down in Miami. He's from there. You know, all of the things that we all know about Mario Cristobal and why he wanted that job will only help him even more in recruiting. The thing that stood out to me when I was watching him at Oregon is th there's no in-state talent in Oregon. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you know this as well as anybody. I mean, you've been out on the West Coast for a long time. and um, like you're at Oregon and Oregon's been a, a, a decent football school for, for a while with some ups and downs, obviously, but there, there's no in-state talent there. And you need to be able to go out of state and, and, and recruit. And uh, that comes with its own burden. You know, you're putting an enormous wear and tear on your coaching staff. Every recruit is a flight away. Um, you're putting a lot of wear and tear on the head coach. Uh, um, so, Yet he was recruiting at a level as high, really, as just about anybody in the country, almost at an Alabama, Ohio State level out there. I mean, he wasn't number one or number two, but he was I think, number four, number five. You know, yeah. he was right there on, on the cusp of that. Um, you know, how incredible really is that when you look at it from that perspective? Yeah, and I think it's going to benefit him in, in two ways at Miami. One, he has the understanding of how that needs to be done to – you know, go to Mississippi and get a Kamari Rogers or go into Georgia and get guys out of Georgia, go to Tennessee for Isaiah Horton and keep him in that class and continue to do that, build upon those relationships and the places that they can go and get guys. And then, you know, compete in state, keep kids home and then go around the state of Florida where we know it's all, it's going to be super competitive. Um, everybody and their mother is going to come in there and try to recruit the state and go everywhere um, so he's going to be able to recruit a lot of South Florida, um, but then go elsewhere and do it because he's had to do it before. And so, you know, when you talk about no talent in the state of Oregon, we're talking about, you know, maybe a handful of kids every year that are legit Division One football players 
Um, and some of those go to like Oregon State and Washington State and some of the lower level programs. Um, so so he really, you know, had to go everywhere. And if you look at the classes, he obviously hit Arizona very hard. Um, he hit he hit California very hard, but he did go national, went to Baltimore um, and, and went other places. And so, you know, Oregon had the facilities. They have the Nike branding. They have all the stuff that's really important to kids sometimes. But on top of that, he just did a tremendous job getting into Southern California. You know, a kid from L.A. or a kid, you know, from, you know, Los Angeles and those areas, the, Oregon is a million miles away for them. So but he really convinced them that it could be a nice spot for them where they can get on the field and play early. He won there and he recruited incredibly well. So I think it benefits him in two ways. One, he has had to do this before where he goes out of state for talent. But now a lot of the talent's going to be in the state. He's very convincing and a very compelling recruiter, and I think he's going to win a lot of those battles. When I tell you that, in not in this recruiting cycle because they didn't finish it, but in the last recruiting cycle, he recruited in a COVID year the top player in nine different states yeah. to come to Oregon, a place they hadn't visited, you know, kind of like in the middle of nowhere, theoretically. I mean, you know, Eugene, Oregon is not the center of the universe for sure. Um, Top player in nine different states, Adam. He got to come to that school. Um, how amazing is that? Yeah, I mean, that just really speaks to his ability to recruit everywhere. To and, and like you said, I mean, everyone knows Oregon football, but not everyone's been there. Um, no one really gets, you know, the feel for it. And, and he's doing it not just in the surrounding states. I mean, he went to, you know, in 2021, if you look, he went to Baltimore, Maryland for two kids, yeah. two four-star kids. So not guys that didn't have other options, guys that couldn't go anywhere else. Um, he, you know, he definitely hit the West. He hit Texas, Utah. Um, you know, Seven McGee is 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 originally from Rochester, New York. He convinced him to stay in the recruiting class um, as other East Coast teams had options. Um, if you look at 2020, he goes to Missouri for a, four, a high four-star defensive back. Um, obviously, California has been hit. He goes to Georgia, Hawaii, Mississippi again. So he clearly, you know, one thing that stands out about him is that he clearly likes to recruit nationally, feels that he can win a lot of those battles, connects with kids across the country, and, and is sort of like a fearless recruiter, just wants to go everywhere and likes recruiting, goes after kids. I saw him on the sideline of a lot of games this year because he was recruiting, you know, Tetaroa McMillan and other guys to Oregon at that time. Um, and it's just a, you know, just a guy that people, you know, you know, he resonates with people. He's going to be able to recruit. And, you know, a, a lot of kids from around the country want to go to Miami anyway, want to live in Miami, want to play for, for the U. I think that's going to just all benefit him more and it's going to propel them into pretty solid recruiting classes. Adam, what makes a great recruiter? You know, I, I don't think it's the used car salesman pitch. I think it's a guy who genuinely connects with people um, and, and sells a vision of what they can do for them in their lives. And so I think it's someone who um, completely understands or at least has a, a you know a good understanding of that person and what drives them, and and that's and that's different for every kid. Um, some kids really care about academics. Some kids don't care if they meet the business you know department. Some kids care about the weight room. Some kids think every school has the, a similar weight room. So c connecting with people on what matters to them, I think, is most important. Selling your vision for what you see for them in their lives having relationships with the people that matter most in their lives. If, you know, there have been stories of guys that, you know, have gone in to recruit and said, you know, your dad and is, has been this and your dad was this guy and that guy, and they have no relationship with their father who was a former NFL player. And so obviously that coach didn't do his research on that kid. So I think those are the things that matter really the most is connecting with people, making them feel important to you, not just another guy that can be in your recruiting class, and then really understanding what they want out of the college experience and what they're looking for. Um, you know, if, you, if you're if really into a business school, sit, have that kid sit down with the dean of the business school at, on, on a visit. You know, bring literature to official or um, to home visits 
that say those things, not just kind of selling the same pitch to kids because, you know, and this is kind of a, a longer story, but, you know, there are kids that talk in group chats all the time. And if everybody's getting the same pitch from a coach, you know, kids are 16 and 17 years old. Uh, they could smell phony immediately. And, uh, and that really turns them off immediately to those coaches. So I think those are the things that really stand out most. Most, a lot of fans think coaches are used car salesmen and, and do the same thing. And that certainly exists, but the really good recruiters connect with people on, on what matters to them in their lives. Miami has been struggling on the college football landscape for a long time right now. And, uh, a lot of people have a lot of different opinions as to why um, I've always felt that it was a byproduct of the people in the building. And, you know, somebody who's been here for, for going on 40 years now, um, I have always found that when the people in the building at Miami were right, that Miami was right. And I'm personally expecting it to get that way now under Mario Cristobal. But what I wanted to ask you is, you know, you guys go around the entire country with the rivals camps, evaluating players, all the different camps that you guys go to on an annual basis. And South Florida has always had the reputation of being the hotbed really in the country for talent. Uh, there's a couple others, obviously, Texas and uh, California gets has a lot of talent and, and stuff. But South Florida has always had that reputation and the stats of players in the national football league and stuff like that seem to back that up. Like I think there's more players in the NFL from Florida than any other state. And um, how, how do you see the talent base in Florida um, and particularly the Southern half of Florida in relation to the rest of the country? Yeah, it's, it's absolutely phenomenal. Um, you know, you can go down the list and, and we have done this before just how many elite players are in the area and just talent in, in South Florida alone. I mean, you're not even talking just South of Orlando. We're just talking in, you know, Fort Lauderdale and South and it's, it's collected talent. And, you know, the problem is, and, and I think Miami's issue has been in recent years, at least, um, is they can't keep those guys home. They, you know, USC has had a similar problem. I think there are parallels to both big city schools um, that that kids want to go elsewhere and get picked apart. Um, you know, Alabama can go in there and get Jerry Judy and Calvin Ridley. And you go down the list of guys from South Florida that are now at Georgia, Alabama, Ohio State, um, all the schools that have been winning or competing for national championships. Um, and that's where a lot of those kids are going. That has to stop. That has to be put a stop to, and those kids have to stay home. It shouldn't be a second or third option for kids anymore to go to Miami if they can't go somewhere else. And there is a humongous opportunity now. Um, you know, Florida State has its own issues. Uh, you know, Mike Norvell has only been there a few years. Billy Napier is now taking over Florida. There's not exactly an established coaching situation in the state where kids are going to want to go play for a legendary coach or a pro, you know, all those things that play into, into those factors. So um, you need to, the, the problem is Alabama can go in there and get whoever they want. Georgia has, has been doing that. Ohio state can do that. You know, that has to at least be blunted. Now you're seeing Texas A&M come in. We could talk about a guy like Shamar Stewart, who is a South Florida kid really has not shown a tremendous interest to be flying all around the country to do things. And it looks like Texas A&M could do that. So that was what Mario has to stop. Or, or at least put a, a, a serious uh, slowdown to to really get those kids to stay home. In terms of talent, if if you could recruit in a 30 mile radius from your campus and basically have your entire recruiting class uh, there and um, and compete at, at the highest level in the ACC, I think Miami, uh, uh, no other school can really say that in the ACC other than Miami, um, but they just have to be able to keep the kids home. Well, even better now, Adam, you got a guy that's going to make an impact in South Florida. I don't think there's any question about that, um, who has the capability to go to nine different states and get the best yeah. player. And if he can do it at Oregon, he can do it at Miami. And um, I personally think it's going to he's very quickly going to change the the, the mood in the room, uh, sure. so to speak, on, on, on all those fronts. Um, signing day uh, last week, how good of a sign was it for Miami to land? Uh, Nigel Lee Kelly and Wesley the Saints. Yeah, well, I mean that's the thing, and and 
those are two local kids and that's exactly what he needs to do because really i mean if you look up and down this class it could have been completely picked apart jacuri brown was hearing from other schools kamari rogers obviously has connections to the mississippi schools chris graves told me just a week before as things were, you know were kind of coming into play and it was unclear what was going on that he was iffy with the Miami class. There were rumors about Isaiah Horton going elsewhere. Markeith Williams was being courted by Nebraska and others till the end. Um, Besaint certainly had other options. Nigel Lee Kelly absolutely had other options. And then, you know, we haven't even addressed Jaleel Skinner yet. But so, I mean, literally everyone in that class so far could have gone elsewhere. Um, and, and that thing could have gone south really, really quick. It didn't. He held it together, and that is a, a completely positive sign moving forward um, about how this can come together. All right, so since you very astutely pointed out that we hadn't addressed Jaleel Skinner yet, um, let's get to Jaleel Skinner. Uh, Alabama commit till the last mo moment. Uh, Miami stole him away. Uh, yeah. You know, your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, this is a kid who's originally from South Carolina, Two years ago, told me if Clemson offered him, he would commit on the spot. That didn't happen. He went through the recruiting process, commits to Alabama. And, you know, usually that's, you know, lock and key. As teammates going there at IMG, you know, everything points to him sticking with Alabama. Miami continues to recruit him. You know, the, the previous staff got him on campus in the summer, so there was a little bit of a seed planted there. But that's exactly what I'm talking about with Mario Cristobal. He's not going to back down because the kid's committed to Alabama. He's he gets a sense that he the kid may want to visit again. He get he convinces him. And Jaleel Skinner is not a kid who really loves to visit around and play the game and all that kind of stuff. So he gets him to visit and gets him to flip, which is just tremendous because you know Jaleel Skinner knows exactly what Nick Saban does with tight ends. He knows the vision for how he would be used in that offense. And he didn't care. I mean, he just he flipped to to Miami at the last minute. That that is huge. Um, I I suspect that will continue to happen under Mario, and, and players of Skinner's caliber will continue to be very very interested. That will then, you know, presumably carry over onto the field like it did at Oregon, and then you know off to the races in terms of recruiting because then, you know, Miami, which obviously wants to be back in that national landscape, will be if he continues to recruit that way. Uh, before I let you go, I wanted to ask you about the transfer portal and how it's transformed recruiting. And um, it's obviously a big premium for schools to have companies, boosters, whatever you want to call them, sitting on the sidelines waiting to help and give kids NIL deals. Um, your thoughts now that we're, you know, into NIL, the new world of NIL for a good year now, um, your thoughts on how it's playing out and what you see for the future of NIL and its relation to recruiting. Yeah, on, on transfers, I think um, one of the things as a company that we're trying to do and, and really consider is putting together high school classes with transfer classes, rating them as one group, uh, because it's really not, you know, if, if Miami, just throw out a number, gets 10 transfers and has nine high school kids, it should be a class of 19, not a class of nine that's rated with transfers not being rated. So I think that's important. The transfer portal can be absolutely utilized to everyone's benefit if so chosen. I know people that have staffs that have someone on staff whose entire job is to monitor the transfer portal and then really get a list together of guys that would be interested in Miami. So you're talking about some of the best quarterbacks in the class right now. I was just doing another interview that three of the best high school quarterbacks from Arizona um, you know, actually four now with Keaton Slovis are all in the transfer portal. You know, mm -hmm. Spencer Rattler was never looking at South Carolina. He's in the transfer portal. So why take a high school kid when you can get Spencer Rattler on your team? So that will definitely be a benefit, especially to new coaches that need a spark early. Um, you know, guys don't get six years anymore. They get three basically. So they don't, they don't even have their own recruiting classes in by the time they're already on the hot seat. So the transfer portal is going to be super important to those guys. NIL has completely changed recruiting in so many ways. Um, it'll be interesting to see if there's any legislation to slow it down. Um, <clears throat> and the idea of NIL was when it started, when players get to college campuses, they will be able to make money. Um, and that's when NIL will start. And now we've seen 
that NIL is completely a part of recruiting. Um, tra- uh, you know, Trevor Etienne is a four-star running back from Louisiana who now has NFTs going out and seeing which alumni group of his final three will buy the most. Um, <laughs> that is not exactly that is not exactly pay for play, but there is certainly a very gray line about where that all stands. And so, um, you know, it is, it, it, it was trying not to be the wild West. It's turned into the wild West a little bit with NIL. Um, but there's absolutely no doubt when, when I've talked to some NIL experts about this, they said that people are going to bring you in and you're going to talk to the academic advisors, the strength and conditioning staff, and our NIL experts to, to tell you, you know, this is how much the former quarterback made at our school. This is how much, you know, potentially you could make at the school with the right deals. And so, you know, Bryce Young makes over a million dollars reportedly. Quinn Ewers, who has hardly even played college and is now transferred, is already over a million dollars NIL. And it will it will go down to everybody because it can be um, it's not intended to be um, a recruiting tactic, but it certainly has become one across the country that I just don't see how you can pull this back now. What do you think of the, the, the Travis Hunter deal? Incredible. I mean, you know, I've been doing this a long time. You've been doing it longer. Um, it's probably the biggest surprise in rivals history by far. There are guys that have flipped, but you know, if he flipped to Georgia, I wouldn't have been shocked. Um, he flips to Jackson State, and it's really interesting. I mean, it's really just interesting. Um, Deion Sanders has proven that he can be a legitimate coach, and I think that there are athletic directors out there that say, you know, Deion Sanders is going to have that personality. Um, I don't necessarily like it or understand it. It might be a risk to, to the, the, the campus culture um, that we want to have for some reason, but he can recruit and he can coach. And that's going to be a very, very interesting thing. Um, Travis Hunter um, basically turned down playing for national championships and being a star every week on national television uh, to play at Jackson State. But there are certainly plenty of players and you go down the list. I I was actually looking at this the other day. It's it's shocking how many players uh, that that were superstars in the NFL played at HBCU. So um, I think it's very interesting, and I also think it could be tremendously um, financially productive for him uh, to be at that school um, to represent the, the the historically black colleges and universities, and um, really make an impact um, in in a lot of ways that other kids that I've talked to said that they would now be interested in playing at a school like that. Um, when, when Travis Hunter gets those NIL deals <clears throat> that, that top a lot of big money, I think a lot of other kids might take a second look at it too. Yeah. A couple million dollars goes a long way to some of these kids and their families and justifiably so. And, uh, yeah. you, you know, it is the wild, wild west and I'm expecting Miami to have to be a player in that. And, and I think that, that there are contingents that are planning to help in that regard. And I'll go out on the limb right now and, and say that I think with Tyler Van Dyke, um, I wouldn't be shocked if a million dollars in NIL comes his way this next year, um, you know, just because of how well he did last season and the profile he's going to have. And I, I, I think the fact that it, it, he could be the beneficiary of making a statement that if you come to Miami and you succeed, you can do the same things that you can do at Bama and Georgia and all these other schools uh, in the NIL world. So that's going to be interesting topic for another day, uh, no doubt, Adam. So uh, thank you so much for your time. He's Adam Gorney, the National Recruiting Director for Rivals.com. Great insight into the recruiting landscape under Mario Cristobal. And uh, we'll be talking to you again, Adam. Thank you for your time. Thanks, Gary.